This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Trail of Bits. Don't leave your project's security audit to just any firm. Trust a team with decades of experience at the forefront of blockchain security research. Go to trailofbits.com to learn more. And by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. And my name is Friederike Ernst. So today we have on the show Dominic Tarr. Dominic is the um, one of the creators of a protocol called Secure Scuttlebutt. And Secure Scuttlebutt is a new type of social network. And it's it's kind of different uh, from, from anything that you know most people are used to, especially in the way that information propagates. And what's interesting about it is it looks a lot more like real human conversations and the way information propagates between you know, humans uh, in the form of gossip than a sort of centralized social network where you post something and then it automatically gets distributed to everybody uh, in your network. So it's, it's, it's really interesting in that sense. And in a lot of ways, when, when you're on, on Secure Scuttlebutt, it, it, it kind of resembles you know, the early days of the internet. It's, it's kind of like early day internet culture and you know, very uh, cool and cordial conversations, but with kind of modern technology. Yeah, so it's an open source project. Um, so there's uh, there's no money at stake, no business interests, which is uh, why I think it f- it's flown a little bit under the radar. Um, but it's super interesting. So uh, listen in. Right. So we have another announcement. We mentioned last week that we would be in Berlin for um, the Interchain Conversations event and the Hack Adams uh, Hackathon. So once again, want to mention that and uh, give you links to register if you're interested. So for the Interchain Conversations event, it'll be happening on full, at Full Node in Berlin on Thursday, June 13th and 14th. And we actually have a discount code uh, if you want to register. Tickets are $165. Um, and with the code Epicenter, you can get those tickets for $100. And that's available for the first 10 people um, who register, uh, first 10 Epicenter listeners who register. So to register, I've got a short link for you. It's an Eventbrite page, so it's a bit of a long URL. But if you go to epicenter.rocks slash interchain Berlin, that's epicenter.rocks slash interchain Berlin and use the code Epicenter, you'll get a discount on registration. And again, that's on June 13th and 14th. Uh, link will be in the show notes. And then right after that event, there's a hackathon that is also taking place at full note. And you can register for the hackathon. Again, the short link for that is epicenter.rocks slash cosmos hackathon Berlin. Epicenter.rocks slash cosmos hackathon Berlin. And you can register for the hackathon that's happening on the weekend on June 15th and 16th. So if you're in the area or if you're in Europe and just a short flight away, uh, do uh, come to full note and see us. Um, Most of us will be there. I think maybe even if we're lucky, we might even get uh, all epicenter listen, uh, all epicenter hosts in one place uh, for the first time ever. So that that would be really interesting and very very exciting if that happens. So yeah, looking forward to see you there. So without further delay, here is our interview with Dominic Tar. Hi, so we're here with Dominic Tar. Dominic started uh, Secure Scuttlebutt, which is a very unique type of social network. I don't know if we even want to call it a social network, but it's a way. To, to talk to people who matter to you and, and others. And uh, Dominic is usually based in New Zealand, or at least um, on the coast of New Zealand, as, as he uh, lives on a, on a sailboat. We'll get a bit into that uh, in the episode. Uh, but for the moment, he's in Berlin. Uh, hi, Dominic. Hi. Thanks for joining us. So why don't you tell us a bit about your background and how you... Uh, got to live on a sailboat. Actually, just for context, you were introduced to us by uh, another New Zealander and friend of the podcast and a uh, lover of boats and things that float, um, Arthur Falls. And uh, and so, uh, yeah, tell us a bit about your background and, and how you how you got this far. Right. Well, I ended up in um, on a 
on a boat because I just decided I didn't want to pay rent. Um, just started to seem like paying rent was like a massive scam. Um, and I realized one day I could live in a boat and instead of paying rent, I could buy a boat. And then after a few years, I've paid for the boat. And then turns out I liked sailing as well. Um, when I first decided to live on a boat, I didn't. I hadn't even seen a sailboat up close. Um, so I kind of got lucky there. I think I'm sure that this sort of was essential in in like leading me down the path where I created Scuttlebutt because um, so things like living on a sailboat, you have a lot of autonomy and you also find yourself in a lot of like um, near-death experiences. So um, you get, you have to be like, you know, you have to, understand how how it's very much like a hacker mindset you have to understand how everything works what the risks are um take actions and decisions and stuff and be confident about what um decisions you make so are you are you sort of in new zealand territory or new zealand waters or are you out in international yeah i'm not even not, i mean i'm not even really sailing uh that, that far. okay just just like a coastally around new zealand but in the sort of boat I could the sort of boat I could afford when I was 21. It was um, like even a small distance was a, um, a big adventure. And the um, the weather in New Zealand has been described as quite moody. So you can have, you can still have terrifying um, adventures. You know, it's sort of relative to like the, the scale of the boat and stuff like this. And the, 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 the new boat is much more, um, is a bit big, is a bit better. Um, and I'm in a much, in a part of the country that has much milder weather. Um, but, if, and it's like all the other things have changed since then. So now, um, I have like, now there's like pretty widespread uh, 3G internet. So, and solar panels are much cheaper. So I have a solar panel, like one solar panel that's enough to run the laptop and there's internet like most of the time. Um, and I'm like doing remote work, so it's it's quite an excellent environment. It's quite literally remote work. Uh, so, how long have you been doing this, and what did you do before you were living on a sailboat? I, I believe you were working a regular job. Oh, uh, I haven't worked a regular job for a long time. So, the current boat I had, I've had like four years now. Um, previous to that, I spent a couple of years. Uh, just traveling constantly. Um, I had um, gotten into uh, Node.js very early on, and then I managed to get invited to speak at a conference, and then I gave um, this talk wearing a wizard hat that was made from a Doritos bag. And after that, I just became um, like quite famous as a uh, distributed systems expert Although I had really just, all I had really done is read the Amazon Dynamo um, paper. And, uh, but I knew just enough more than everyone else that I could like pass off as an expert. And this was like, at this point, I didn't realize it yet, but I was well on the way to um, Scuttlebutt. So in this process, I learned basically everything I needed to know to think of Secure Scuttlebutt. And um, yeah, so then I, it was just like kind of exhausted. So that, at that period, I was like, traveling like at least nine months of the year. Um, I think one year I didn't spend longer than six weeks in any one country. Um, this was like, but this got to be quite exhausting and I was like, I need to be settled down. Um, so I bought a boat and now I only travel like three months of the year, which um, is still a lot by ordinary people's standards, but is like quite, quite settled and civilized compared to what I was doing previously. Cool. That uh, that hat story is uh, hilarious. Um, so, um, can you describe a little bit your path towards building Secure Scuttlebutt, and basically what motivated you to build um, uh, the 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 protocol as is? Yeah. So the for there was a period where I like I knew I wanted to build a um, some kind of decentralized mm -hmm. application platform. Um, and I didn't really know, but I didn't really know how it was going to work. Um, and my motivation was actually more about, so I started exploring this before, like, um, before Edward Snowden and things like that. Like, it was like, 
privacy wasn't actually my main um, item. It was more about um, it was more about autonomy, in the sense that like you know you look at um, so I remember being like frustrated um, that Facebook would just change how the interface worked from an interface I was used to to an interface that like I hated. And I just had no recourse at all. Like it was really frustrating and there's like nothing, um, there's no kind of, there's no like way to like vent that frustration. Like you, there's no way to like fix the problem um, or even like express that there is a problem. Whereas like, you know, if you live in a democratic country, then at least you can vote for the other party every couple of years or something like that. So you can write a letter to the editor and like threaten that you're going to vote for the other guy. And with software, it's just like there's nothing, uh, there was nothing like this. And like my previous, so before all the boat stuff, I had um, what I call my first and last professional growing up job where, so before that, there was another boat trip and I ended up at this like happy commune and I stayed there for a, a few, uh, a month or so and I was like, this is great, but just becoming happy would be too easy. You know, I need to go to the city and get a job and give polite society a fair chance. And so I did that. And after 18 months, I decided that um, Polite Society had failed me. It didn't like, so basically I had this job where um, I I realized that, so the software we were providing customers was really crap. Um, But it wasn't, the technical problems weren't really that hard. The hard part was the um, social structures around surrounding it. So the basically uh, my boss, would go talk to their boss over a golf game or something like this. He'd be like, oh, you're a good guy. Let's, I'll, we'll use the software, software. And then the people who actually had to use the software, um, which would generally, uh, are the, like the accounting department, they had no, they didn't actually have any say in the software. And they find it, when they found it quite frustrating, they talked to me, but I wasn't allowed to fix their problems because we had to generate um, billable hours. And I would have loved to have fixed their problems. But, um, you know, that I was only able to really do things like that when my boss was on holiday um, because otherwise I had to, like, just, you know, fight fires and stuff like this. So that got me, like, that sort of made me real. That sort of got me thinking that, you know, the person who is, like, you know, on the front lines has a very good perception of what the problems actually are. But there's they're often not in a situation where they can actually do anything to affect those problems. So there's so much software that's like really um, frustrating, but unless you're inside the organization that created that software, it's unlikely you can do anything about it, um, even complain about it in a a satisfying way, Uh, except for open source. Open source has a lot more, um, you know, you can actually attain a feeling of um, agency or you can sometimes, you know, point out a problem and it gets, I've had sometimes where I've pointed out a problem and it's been fixed immediately. Um, or if, even if I don't uh, make the pull request or something like this, often you can talk to, talk to developers and like persuade them or negotiate some kind of solution. So like this. And I find that that is like hugely satisfying. You generally need to be a developer to be able to have access to that kind of thing. But I was sort of thinking, I was sort of interested in how you would make more egalitarian software, basically. And this sort of led me towards decentralization because in decentralized software. So in Scuttlebutt, there's, there's protocol and then application. And the pro, so, and just because I designed the protocol doesn't mean I can control what application you use to access it. So even if you build like a commercial application for using Scuttlebutt, um, you can't really stop other people from using different software. And uh, I don't have the solution to like, how do you create truly egalitarian software? Um, but my intuition was that decentralization capable protocol um, would be a big part, a big potential part of that. Let's talk about security. You know, dApps are pretty unique because unlike other types of software, they can hold astronomical amounts of value. That's why getting systems audited, creating robust security processes, and fostering a culture of security in your organization is so important. 
And to do this, you should only trust experts with real security expertise. There are a lot of security firms in the blockchain space, but few have the experience and track record of Trail of Bits. And they've been in business since 2012, long before things like the DAO hack were even imaginable. Trail of Bits works with your team to audit every aspect of your project. And smart contract code is just the beginning. They'll help you implement best practices around things like DevOps, key storage, and user-facing applications. And once your software has been rigorously tested and reviewed by Trail of Bits, they'll provide the tools you need to make sure that your code remains safe over every new commit. They can even put a software security expert at your team's disposal who will give you advice and answer your questions when you need them. It's like having your own security engineer on staff. But don't take my word for it. Go to their publications repo on GitHub to read their papers, presentations, and security reviews. It's no wonder teams like Parity, Status, New Cipher, and organizations like Facebook and DARPA trust Trail of Bits for their security audits. To learn more, go to trailofbits.com, and if you decide to reach out, make sure you let them know you heard about them on Epicenter. We'd like to thank Trail of Bits for their support. So, um, Secure Scrattlebud is um, open source and um, uh, decentralized uh, in, uh, in a form that we're not that used to, um, which we'll go into in a little bit. Um, so, but maybe let's talk about what it is um, first. So basically, I think, I think uh, earlier we referred to it both as a social network and a messaging protocol. So what, what in your eyes is the function of, um, of Secure Scuttlebutt? Well, generally, I start by explaining the name. So um, Scuttlebutt um, is like an old nautical term for gossip. So Scuttle means uh, open or opened, um, and butt is a barrel. So it's the opened barrel of um, it's like the it's the drinking water um, on an old um, sailing ship. Yeah, like a water cooler, and that has a that becomes synonym for gossip um, inevitably. And then the thing with human gossip is gossip isn't considered very reliable um, it, because I can say something to you. And then you can say something different to someone else, but say that that's what I said. So, um, or you just misheard it, or you know, it could be malicious, or it could be um, you misheard it, um, or something like that. But interestingly, gossip is actually a, a type of um, computer protocol in some computer systems. One computer talks to another computer directly, and that's the only way that those two computers communicate. But you can also have so in a gossip protocol. A message can get from one computer to another computer by jumping around um, other computers first. So in a gossip protocol, you send a, when you send a message, you don't really even say, oh, it's going to this protocol. You just like broadcast it and it drifts out to like all of the computers. Um, eventually it gets to the one that you need. And these kinds of protocols are extremely resilient because um, if some computers are missing, it doesn't matter. It just goes to other computers instead. Basically, I read about this um, subsystem of DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is part of Amazon. So they use it to implement your shopping carts and stuff like that. Um, and it had a part, it had a gossip protocol inside of it that just kept track of the uh, computers that were like in their cluster. So they had a peer-to-peer -peer system that was inside of their data center. And I sort of took some of the, I sort of took that basic idea and then added enough security so that you didn't need the data center anymore. So it makes a secure gossip protocol. So in a secure gossip protocol, it doesn't have the unreliable um, problem. So you can pass on the messages I say, but you can't change them. So um, my friend can verify that that's what I said. Yeah, so I, I tried a bunch of other things. So I was originally thinking of a design that was a bit more like, um, a little bit more like IPFS than Scuttlebutt originally. But eventually I realized that by building a um, social network, um, you sort of solve a lot of the security problems, but by basically passing them on to the humans. So for example, how do you deal with spam? Um, Computers aren't very good at filtering out what is spam and what isn't spam, but humans are really good at that. Humans have, you know, been you know, they spend all their time basically deciding who they can trust and who they can't trust. So instead of making the computer decide that, just put a button that says, with human can say, this is my friend and this isn't my friend. 
And then so that that sort of stuff, the, the trust decisions, you just push up to the human layer and then the computers just sort of replicate the messages perfectly, which is what computers are really good at. So could you walk us through the sort of typical experience for someone who's joining Secure Scuttlebutt? Um, so if, if I've just heard of Secure Scuttlebutt and I know that I have some friends on it, um, how does that work? And and then maybe also it's, it would be interesting to describe um, the, the the way that messages actually get transmitted and how one and so how they, they function more like actual human conversations and human gossip than the social network <laughs> structures that we're used to. Yeah. So the you to join the Scuttlebutt network, you basically someone else who's already in the network has to follow you. So it has to start requesting your messages. And then um so ba- so there's a couple of ways of, of doing that. The best way is if they are in the same room as you on the same Wi-Fi, then they install, so you install Scuttlebutt and then there's like a local broadcast so you can see each other over the local network and then they then they click follow. And so follow make, makes their computer start replicating your messages and it also posts a message to their feed saying that they followed you. And that means that their friends now know about you and they can start replicating your messages as well. Um, and at the same time, you click follow for them and then you start replicating their messages and then you're basically in the network. So every time that these two people meet on on a on a local area network on the same Wi-Fi or even I guess also exchanging sort of USB keys if they want, like it, it can degradate it can degradate down to that level. Um, then they will replicate each other's messages. So basically replicating the data on each other's system. So this kind of works it's like the, the the friend request here um, kind of works like a, a, a real life a relationship. I meet someone and all of a sudden I want to know um, about what's going on in their life. You know, like I become friends with them and then I engage in conversation with them. And so we sort of replicate experiences, stories, you know, things that we tell each other. Yeah. But it happens in a physical uh, location. Yes. Yes. So that works really well. Um, of course, sometimes people like to use their computers to talk to each other over the internet when they're not um, face-to-face. And, but that has this problem um, that was meant to be solved by IPv6, but um, hasn't yet been rolled out yet. It's only been 20 years. Um, and the, you know, now we have this problem where basically imagine so the internet is like, imagine we ran out of telephone numbers and now there are two to- sorts of phones. There's one that only businesses can afford, which can answer messages. And then ones that ordinary people have, which can only dial numbers, but can't um, receive calls. And this makes it very difficult to, well, but this is, but it's IP addresses. So it means that you can call someone who has a um, a website, but you can't just call your friend. So making a full peer-to-peer application work properly is kind of is quite tricky. Um, there's sort of hacks to get around it, but the what we've found is good enough for Secure Scuttlebutt is just some people run servers on a um, with an IP address with a static IP address. We call this a pub server. Um, it's named pub because it both sounds like public. And like a pub, as in like an English pub, as in like a bar, um, public house, which is like a place you can meet your friends to exchange gossip. Um, and these pubs are like quite different to like, uh, you know, Mastodon or email servers because the pub isn't. So in email, you have server email servers, but the server actually owns your identity. So your identity is name at server. And in Scuttlebutt, the pub uh, is at best just a, like a robot that happens to be your friend, that happens to act like your friend. So you're not, your identity isn't actually tied to any one pub. It's just a place, it's just an a entity that probably has your messages that you can reliably connect to. And if I understand correctly, there are two types of messages. So there are messages that you just broadcast through the world that um, are um, readable to anyone. And there, but I could also send you a private message, correct? Yeah. So a private message is just a public message that the body is encrypted. 
every so basically it's a broadcast model so everyone receives all of your messages um but they can't but if it's encrypted they can't read that message um so i encrypted message so that only like you and that only you and bob can um decrypt it and everyone else gets it and passes it on but they can't decrypt it and this actually this actually has very good um privacy properties because so it doesn't hide that I sent a message. Everyone knows I sent a message. Um, but no one actually know. Who, everyone tries to decrypt it, and therefore no one except the people that it's for actually know who it's for. Because um, anyone, like it could have potentially been for anyone that follows me. I see. This makes perfect sense. Um, so basically seeing that you don't have um, people like servers or, you know, like people who actually own your... Uh, who, who actually are your point of access, it's it's asynchronous by design, right? So basically, if I send you data or some some kind of message, you don't, if you're not online, you're not getting it uh, at that moment. And um, so, so can you describe the process by which this me message kind of permeates the network and arrives, um, arrives at your device? Yeah, so basically when any two peers uh, connect to each other, they start by doing a handshake where they're basically like, so they start by just sending a list of who they have talked to since the last time they talked to you. And they check if you have the same news. So it's like, I see you, I bump to you on the street and I'm like, oh, hey, have you heard from, have you heard from Bob recently? And you're like, oh, no, I haven't. And then I tell you the news about Bob. And then if sometimes you, you have already had heard the gossip about Bob from a different channel, in which case we see that and then don't send anything. So, so let's maybe just use sort of your, your example or it's like your, your life as an example. Like you live on a boat, right? And um, let's say that I live in New Zealand and, you know, Federica lives in Germany. Um, so you're on your boat and you write public posts. And oh, by the way, we're all friends. So you, you, you write public posts like today I caught this huge fish and like today there was like a big gust of wind and I went really far. Okay, like I'm not a... I'm, I'm, I'm like, I don't know much about boats. <laughs> that stuff happens. That stuff that, definitely happens. That's like yeah. the, the two things that happen on a boat, right? Then I, I, you know, you come to shore. I meet you. We sit in a in a cafe, and then we, um, I, I get all those updates. So you know, like maybe like a month of updates. Basically, just you life blogging, kind of your diary of what's happening in your boat. I get all that stuff, and I'm like, great. And then uh, maybe also you sent a private message to Federica. Um, And then at some point, you know, Federica comes to, to New Zealand for like some conference and you're still on your boat and then we meet up. She'll, she'll presumably get all of those public updates because I'm friends with her. And then she'll also get the private messages you sent her because I'm gossiping those to her. So the, the messages are all just in one um, log. So it'll just be like public, public, private, public, whatever. So they just all sort of come and they just all get copied across and they always get copied across from oldest to newest. And that means that if it breaks partway through, um, next time it just can replicates from there. So, it so always I'm, I'm only receiving, that. I'm only receiving that private message to Felica because the client knows that we're both friends. Uh, no, you, the, the message, the, you don't know that it's for um, Frederica. Okay. Um, You just you just take all of my messages in order. Um, some all of, them of your messages, through. regardless of whether or not I know those people, whether or not they're friend, we're friends or whatever. I just duplicate everything. I replicate everything that you've posted. Yes. Okay. So there might be some garbage in there, like for people that I'll never encounter and for whom those messages will never get sent from me. Yeah, but right. but replicating these extra messages isn't a huge burden. Basically, it's designed so that it all fits within the realm of just like the small favor that you wouldn't really think about doing for a friend. Like it's not really a problem. Um, even if like, even after like several years of using Scuttlebutt a lot, because, you know, talking about Scuttlebutt, talking on Scuttlebutt every day, um, my entire list of messages is only like 10 megabytes or something like that. Oh, okay. So it's quite efficient then. Yeah. So it's not, it's not really, um, and it could be more efficient as well. But it's just not it's not really um, a big deal to have a few extra messages. The the thing that is a bigger deal is uh, like attachments that are images and files and that sort of stuff. 
but that is sort of handled separately. So you won't take those unless um, you want to like view them. So that's left, that's sort of handled by a different protocol. So if I took a picture of that fish, if you didn't look at the picture of the fish, you might not see it. You might not have it to pass on to Frederica. Okay, I see. So basically, it's it's a lot like having your own personal blockchain um, that you share with people, and where you basically cryptographically encode parts of the of of uh, your updates, so they're only uh, readable for some people. So, can you talk a little bit about the role that um, that public servers play? Play so basically the pub servers that that uh, when when you log into the network and you connect to it, um, you kind of you, you can you can get an invite from a pub server. So can you talk a little bit about that? The pub servers only really exist to um, create um, to make it possible to connect to the network. Um, it's kind of wrong to say log in because when you say so, there's some terms we have. Um, left over from, you know, that we're used to using on set like account and login and like logging in is like, you know, you go into a, you check into a hotel and they write your name in a book and um, account is like you join a club and they write your name down and in a book. And that kind of concept really isn't, um, doesn't really apply in the Scuttlebutt world. It's more like you just create an identity. And once you've created an identity, um, you are, um, other people can have relationships with you. So the, the role of the pub is really, pubs, in an ideal world, we wouldn't even need pubs. It's just because of this um, shortage of IP addresses and because your computer, um, so, you know, like I have friends here, I'm in Europe right now, my friends who are in New Zealand tend to be asleep now uh, while I'm awake and then awake when I'm asleep. So there's only a small gap when we might both be online. Um, but if there's a server that follows me, it will get my messages and then give it give them to my friends. Um, so later. in a way, if the network were dense enough, you wouldn't need those servers, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And all the, if all the servers went away, uh, if you know, like some kind of like um, you know zombie apocalypse took out all the data centers and all the national level infrastructure. Um, Scuttlebutt would still work as long as we had like solar panels and like local to run our laptops and local Wi-Fi. And we just like, you know, uh, we could like put SD cards onto migrating birds or something like that. Um, that would actually work. Couldn't we, couldn't Scuttlebutt utilize sort of similar architecture to BitTorrent to reduce its dependency on these servers? With uh, Yes, so BitTorrent has this uh, DHT thing um you you could do that um but the problem with a dht is you still need to have um to make a proper peer-to-peer -peer connection you basically need to do this trick where uh it's called um hole punching without getting stuck in the, the weeds it's more like being set up on a date than by just like than just making a phone call so you need to have an introducer that is a, a third part, uh, a third party that you connect that connects you, and then once you've connected, then you then you can talk directly. Right. So this, this is what the torrent trackers uh, fulfill as a role, I, I suppose. So you still need to have some sort of a yeah, a central point of trust, uh, which introduces the uh, at least the first initial peers yes. uh, for discovery, and then okay. Yeah. So you'd still need to have something like pub servers for that anyway, and you like i think so basically i use the pub server design so that there would be because it's like there's just enough reason for people to um who are like you know good at computers to be able to run a pub server it's not really that much effort um you know lots of people have like developers and computer people and stuff like this really have a server um that they pay for and they run a website off it or something like this and you could put the pub server on that and that's enough to like act as an introducer to your friends. So this, this is the plan. We haven't actually got around to implementing this like fully peer-to-peer -peer thing, but the idea was that it's enough um, that people will want to run the the pubs and then they can act as introducers. 
And then you've got a full peer-to-peer -peer thing. And as long as one of your friends has a server, then it should you'll be fine. But it doesn't really matter if um, more than one or you know, if more more than more than one do, great, but it doesn't really matter. Um, mm -hmm. and this means that the requirement of of like the server being up all the time is actually very low. So contrast that with like email, like if your email server goes down and someone tries to send you an email, then they'll just get a message back saying it didn't work. In Scuttlebutt, if the, if the pub that we were going to communicate through um, is down at the time, it just, it's still, you just post a message on your log, it will get, when the server comes back up, it will receive the message then. So it's just like, you don't need to worry about, um, it just everything works smoothly, even if there's um, offline. So yeah, what, one, one fun anecdote is one time, my friend Yoren was on an airplane and he was browsing Scuttlebutt and um, completely offline. It was just like his local database. And the person sitting next to him is like, how come you have the internet when like no one else has? And he's like, oh, well, I'm actually not on the internet. Let me explain. So he explains Scuttle, Scuttlebutt. It turns out this guy was um, some uh, electrical engineer from the South African Antarctic base. <laughs> so they had like, you know, like not very much or very, they probably have some kind of satellite thing. But basically, they have a lot of dough and step in Antarctica. And yeah, it's going to work great. So how many users are there? How many connections do they have on average? And have you done any uh, any percolation theory on the on the graph to see how long messages would actually take to percolate the the network to to outliers, say the say the uh, South uh, South African and Arctic base? Um, or did, is is uh, have you done any data science on this at all? Not um, really. I mean, there's so much things uh, to do. Just like using the thing, um, usually, like there's certainly been cases where we're having a conversation with someone and messages get through pretty quick, um, like fast enough. Um, sometimes, you know, someone, if you're offline, I mean, a message could, if you're writing them offline, message could be delayed for an arbitrary amount of time, um, depending on how long it takes to get online. Once you're sort of connected in the, the community group, um, it's pretty fast. So the pro the protocol is kind of designed so I can't know too much, um, like about like who's using it. We do know there's we can see like ten thousand um, ish. Um, I haven't really looked, um, but um, Andre looked recently. He's building the Android app, um, like ten thousand ish um, identities on the in the network. There could be more people who have installed it but haven't connected to the network. And then there's, you know, like a, a small, but very vibrant community of people that's like maybe a few hundred that are like um, still regularly using it. So we didn't, we didn't put any um, kind of like notification or something to put, pull people back. So people that are still in the, you know, community that are there because they've made friends and they're coming back actively to check and participate in discussions. So mm -hmm. yeah, I looked into this a little bit uh, yesterday when I did my research for this ep episode and it seems to be a super friendly community very unexpected when you are when you're usually on Twitter um so I, I have I have one question one last question for the protocol so in um there's um no cost to broadcasting right so basically mm -hmm. I, I can give you as my friend I can give you an arbitrarily long list of messages that I would like to um see passed out into the world um do, do you see any kind of attack that would use this property that basically, as my friend, you're kind of obliged to take on my gossip no matter whether it's relevant or whether it's borderline abuse or whether it's abuse? You're not really obliged um, because you're free to change your mind. Um, that's one of the sort of philosophical design ideas behind Scuttlebutt is everything is voluntary. So if you don't want to do something, if you don't want to connect to a particular peer or relay a particular peer's messages, you can always um, get out of that. It doesn't, like other things like a DHT only only really work if you sort of interact with everyone uniformly. There's no way to choose which peers you want to, um, you know, interact with. On You can't make any value judgments in, 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 a, book, in a blockchain. Um, and Scuttlebutt, you could always make value judgments. So if you did make a math, like an unreasonably long log, 
um, I could just, um, I would just block you. Okay, so if I were to DOS the network, I'd just be blocked by all my friends and I'd have yeah. no friends left. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Cool. Yeah. With regards to interests and topics and sort of things that people are using the Scuttlebutt for, when you, when you, when you download Patchwork and you install it and you, you get to a pub server, there's all these topics, sort of like hashtags, which are quite diverse and there's like all kinds of different topics. So could you talk about how those work and... You know this community of people that are there. Uh, what are some of the dominant uh, communities and themes that are being discussed on Scuttlebutt in sort of the open forums? There's sort of a, a kind of variety of things. There's definitely uh, people that have like uh, privacy and decentralization interests, but there's also like um, I think there's an unreasonable amount of people that um, are living. Um, in cabins in the wood or in boats or something like that. Um, there's a lot of people talking about stuff like that. There's this whole um, solar punk idea. Um, are you familiar with this too? A, a little bit, yeah. I think I think someone mentioned it on the podcast before. Can you give a Can you give a brief explanation for me though? Yeah. So solar punk is the hopeful genre of scientific that we of science fiction that we have been waiting for. So. Basically, it's like, so we have cyberpunk, which is like dystopian um, with computers and VR, and steampunk, which is like this historical fantasy where like Victorian um, stuff just continued. But solarpunk is like, it's an it's a optimistic future, maybe in 100 years or something like this, where um, humans now live in, that still high tech, but now they live in harmony with nature. We, someone, um, Zach, came on, Scuttlebutt, and it's like, oh, has anyone heard of this um, this genre of science fiction? I really like it. Um, and we suddenly all got really excited, and we're just like, we are solar punks. Like, this is what we're trying to do. Um, and interestingly, it can be sort of, it can be traced back to a particular Tumblr post, post where someone just sort of describes um, an aesthetic. So there's lots of ways of, um, you know, there's lots of people who are concerned about climate change and the environment and things like that, but Solar punk is like this vision of like what the world would be like if we saw if we solve all these problems, and I think that's really important because just um, thinking about the problem of you know the impending climate collapse that we're causing is like way too depressing. Yeah, I, I would invite our, our listeners to Google uh, solar punk. It, it never rains in solar punk land. Well, I, I think, no, it, it definitely rains. But there's a lot of rainbows. <laughs> yeah, yes. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. Moving on to uh, uh, another topic that you know, I, I really wanted to talk to you about um, is uh, is this idea of centralization versus decentralization. You, you gave a talk, uh, I think it was uh, earlier this year or maybe last year. Last at, year. At, last year at the Decentralized Web Summit uh, where you uh, sort of redefine the idea of decentralization. And I thought it was interesting from the point of view that, you know, it's, it's, decentralization is sort of the opposite of centralization and everybody in the blockchain space i think is like striving or trying to you know reach the goal of like building more decentralized systems when 
it's just sort of the opposite of something else. And you made the argument that it would be much better for the for the communities working on this stuff to try to actually define sort of in a positive way what they're trying to achieve. So like rather than like the opposite of decentralization, like what's the sort of positive um, version of that? Yeah. So describe in in your in your words what it is that projects like uh, Secure Scalabut and maybe some other sort of blockchain projects with similar goals are trying to achieve and how we should maybe use that when educating people about like the benefits of this. Yeah, well, I think the thing with cent- about centralization is it's it des- centralization describes a, a structure like a, like a pyramid or a star where there's like one thing in the center that's in control and a bunch of things outside of that. And decentralization presumably is anything but that. And that includes a lot of different things. So you could have a, you know, all of the nodes in a circle and then everyone is connected to everyone. Um, That's kind of like how a DHT works. And that has a sort of a uniform structure where all the nodes are strictly equal. And then you could have like a grid or like a lattice um, structure. So there's actually networks that do have that shape. So um, Cell phone towers are actually arranged in a hexagonal lattice. And you can imagine mesh networks, stuff like this laid out, you know, in some kind of more haphazard version of that kind of structure. Um, Scuttlebutt, because it is um, based on the idea of a social network, it's actually not quite uh, a uniform mesh because some people have a lot of friends. Um, and other people have fewer friends. Uh, there's like a range of things. So this is called a, uh, a small world or a scale-free network. And this has some interesting properties. And, uh, you know, there's actually a lot of things that behave like this. So, but particular, particular of interest is um, human relationships. So um, you've probably heard of this um, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So the idea is that every – Kevin Bacon has been in so many movies that you have been in a film with someone who has been, you've either been in a film with, with Kevin Bacon or you've been in a film with someone who has been in a film with Kevin Bacon or someone who has been in a film with someone who's been in a film with Kevin Bacon and so on. And it's actually like quite um, surprisingly short path from any particular person to Kevin Bacon. There's nothing really special about Kevin Bacon, just that he has uh, been in a lot of movies. Um, there's a path from anyone to everyone quite often through Kevin Bacon because of all the movies he's been in. And this is kind of like, you get this kind of thing through um, like celebra- celebrities, basically. So um, celebrities have a lot, know a lot of people um, and are known by a lot of people. And this makes um, celebrities like a little bit centralized, but I think it's okay because First of all, they don't completely control who, like, they can't force anyone to like them. They have to, they only, people don't like them because they do good stuff. Like, they're, they're funny or, in, you know, they make great music or something, or make music that people enjoy, et cetera. And if a celebrity starts doing stuff that you don't like, then you can stop liking them and then they lose, start to lose their power. So it's kind of a, a bottom up um, thing where, you know, there are some points that have more power, but they're not, they don't have absolute power. Maybe Kevin Bacon should have a uh, Scuttlebutt pub server. Yeah, sure. Yep. So what are the, in your view, like the, the problems with centralized systems? So I, I think maybe to preface this, you know, we could talk about it in the context of this trilemma between scalability, security, and user experience. And, you know, where do the, where do the problems start to emerge when all of those properties kind of erode? And where does Scuttlebutt sit on that triangle? Well, um, Scuttlebutt is hot. It's like highly, um, but it's, it's scalable and secure and as good, a, um, as good a user experience as it can um handle i think these kinds of um trilemmas are like not necessarily like there are some designs that are just better than other designs so 
you can have, if you have a really good design, you can have more than your share of all three. A really bad design will be stuck out in um, one corner. Um, so we're sort of somewhere in the middle. You know, some things that would make it perhaps a better user experience is if it like did all those things but didn't use any data on your phone at all um, or didn't use any storage. And, of course, that's um, not realistic. For me, I think the most important thing is who is like in control of um, the system? Like, are you able, if you have a problem, are you able to make some deliberate choice that yeah, does that's... something to um, improve your situation? So like, if you, if there's something that you don't like, can you make a decision about it? So for example, um, my, my G, the, the email app on my phone um, from Google has these um, suggestions of like someone sends a message and be like, you can say one of these canned things. And I really wish this would go away because like I it feels I feel that it would be like the height of insincerity to just push a button and send someone a canned message rather than type out what I actually think. Really, it's like it's convenient, but I don't actually want convenience. Like I want to write a um to my, when I write a message to my friend, I actually want to write it. But often, often the messages that uh, that Google kind of gives you, um, they are they are sound bites of of things you regularly write. So things like, sure, let's do that. So or uh, you know, like uh, that works for me, or you know, something that that is you know like um, that that is approving in some way. I, I don't ever get ones way that 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 say uh, this doesn't work for me, or let's let's do it another way. Because presumably, because I don't write that as often, um, and why 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 would you see it as ins insincere to to press uh, autocomplete and just send it off like that? Because I mean, it 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 just it it in a way you could also just do a thumbs up, right? Yeah. So if but if someone actually typed a thumbs up, um, they, I know how much effort they put in. If they push the button, it looks like they put in more effort than they really did. So if it said. Um, if they push the button and it said autocomplete message from Google, then I would know um, that they just pushed one button. So there's in this case where, you know, it used to say like sent from my iPhone. That actually helps because if someone puts like a really short, awkward message that's like badly typed, it's like, okay, they sent it on the phone. So that's acceptable. Um, if they push a thing that just says like that's the canned message, it's like, oh, you didn't really, um, you know, it's about estimating how much effort someone put in. Um, And I feel that is like the the essence of, um, you know, to show someone respect when you're talking to them over, you know, via text. It's like you need to tell how much um, how much effort they've put in to writing that message to you. Mm -hmm. And just pushing a button, very little, very little effort. And so I'm kind of terrified every time I see that that um, <laughs> I use one inappropriately, especially if it's something like um, this totally where it's like the the express the things are like the opposite of what I actually want to say and like mm -hmm. that I'm terrified of like hitting one by accident mm -hmm. um but the, the the place where this is relevant to scuttlebutt is like this is like these things are like like Google has spent all of these all of this effort like analyzing what people they're probably they're doing things like testing if people push the buttons and keeping track of that and stuff like that but they didn't actually ask me what I wanted they are just studying me um so I don't really feel like if they actually asked me and responded to that then I would feel um like I had some influence okay so you just you don't just want to be a b tested yeah I don't want to a b tested I want to be able to choose a or b okay. uh, that would feel like uh, that would I think that would be a better user experience that would give me a feeling of autonomy um, instead, I have. I, instead, I feel like an animal that's being like herded. They they could do an A B test where you know some of a group of the people they're just asked instead of uh, you know being randomly assigned and see. <laughs> so basically, a meta A B test uh, whether people actually like A B testing. Okay, yeah, so, I, think, um, I think that would be interesting. Um, let's let's go back to the to the topic of uh, centralization versus decentralization. I, I think it's um, it's a hallmark, hallmark of human nature that you think um, the time that you live in is special in some way, mm -hmm. right? Oh, so yeah. it, 
it feels like uh, over the past, uh, say, 50 years or maybe 30 years, um, things have been have become enormously centralized. So if you look at the amount of data that, for instance, uh, Google or Facebook or Twitter actually amass, it's, it's enormous, right? Um, so do you actually think that this is um, some sort of a special point in history where we have to choose the right path or do you think that you know this just seems like it right now or does it, or maybe it doesn't seem like that to you at all but uh, uh. yes well I think um yeah I think I do um in particular so there's some things is like so like cryptography is actually very like modern cryptography is very new like computer science has existed since the Okay, computers have only existed since the 50s, but computer science has existed a little bit longer than that. Let's say the 30s or something like this. But um, cryptography, modern cryptography, um, so both hashes and signatures have only existed since the 70s. Um, and we're only just beginning to figure out how you can build things using cryptography. Um, without cryptography, without like, so... For long, the first like massively deployed cryptography was uh, TLS. So this lets you uh, connect to a server and then do uh, a secure connection. So that this means that no one else can see your credit card number and that you can log into to websites with a password without anyone seeing that. Without this, it would be basically impossible to do copious over the internet. It would just be too insecure to really um, to to buy or sell things or, or like, you know, own and interact and control things. Um, and that's really just getting started. That's just like the simplest possible thing. They're basically taking like an insecure network and securing it. And um, there's so many more things that you can build using um, by, so basically secure, all the other, all the recent things, I call it um, cipher space. So cipher space, so cyberspace is the space created by signals. So that's like the, the ordinary internet. Cipher space is the space created by algorithms. A cipher means like algorithm or code. Um, in cipher space, the security isn't in the network. The security is in the data. So the database is secured and the information inside it is secure. And we're just totally beginning to experiment with how you can build things like this. There's a few uh, examples, like all of these examples, so Git, um, blockchain, um, SSB, IPFS, DAT, um, are like, you know, it's just basically we're just experimenting. It's a totally different approach with lots of different um, approach uh, with different approaches. I think the thing is as well is that I think potentially like there's all of these, um, you know, there's this like cyber war thing, and like computers as they are are so terribly insecure um, that we need. Um, we just need something. There's so many problems to fix. So currently, you have all these, um, you know, s like states, like governments, um, having hackers like hack each other and collect all these vulnerabilities, and they're just sort of hoarding them. And the, the funny thing is, that they don't really use them very often because if you use them, so zero day is only useful if no one knows about it, no one else knows about it. So if you, you if you have a vo no vulnerability and you use it you'll reveal that you know that. And then, then if someone else does know that vulnerability, now they'll know that you knew it. And so they will better estimate how many other things you must know about if you were willing, willing to burn that one. Um, so they're just like hoarding these vulnerabilities, but it's like, um, so it's kind of like an arms race, but you could have a, a defensive arms race where this just all goes away if you actually um, had a secret if you actually had a secure system. So, you know, the fairy tale of the three little pigs. So there's three pigs and one builds a straw house, one builds a stick house, and one builds a brick house. And the, the wolf just comes along and he just blows the straw house over and blows the stick house over. And that's kind of like how most computer systems we have today are like all operating systems and stuff like this. Like you just have to, when you attack it, attacking sounds actually misleadingly violent because you don't, actually attack it like you don't attack it like you might attack a person with a with a, like a, a blunt object you attack a computer by just asking it to attack itself 
and you just have to find exactly the right way to trick to like to trick it to like um, falling apart. And the third little pig has a brick house, and this is like a sturdy house that can't be blown over. Um, we could build this brick house if we had uh, using like cryptography and end-to-end encryption and secure sandboxing and stuff. Like I definitely think this uh, the brick house software is possible. Um, it's just needs more people working on it. We just need to rewrite everything we're doing and start again from scratch, basically. But I think it can probably be, I think it can be done. And I think it would be better that we do that than um, be hoarding these, you know, that continue to have insecure um, computer systems. We just need to sort of approach this in a way where um, you start, you have to just find a niche that really needs this and then get it working well enough and then expand out to other things. So to, to follow up on that question, you know, revolutions have been around since the dawn of time and people have been you know, fighting against uh, concentration of power and central, centralization of power since forever. And there are sort of these waves, right? So, you know, uh, the French Revolution was one. I, I wonder if at our particular point in existence and at the dawn of what might, some people might call the technological singularity, if we as a society might cross a point where it is no longer possible to revolt against centralized systems. Because once um, state powers or you know, concentrate enough power and a lot, enough technology for mass surveillance, um, you know, just look at China, for example, it's very hard for people there to revolt. We kind of see it there a little bit. It's very hard for people there to revolt because of the fact that these technologies exist and they're, they're so powerful in serving the interests of the state itself. So I wonder if you think that the, if, this is, if this is true, that at some point we arrive as a society as, at a point where going back is no longer an option. Like we get to a point of no return with regards to our personal sovereignty and sort of like protection of our privacy and data, et cetera? Well, I think the thing um, that's the force that's um, on the side of decentralization is that innovation is always um, anti-authoritarian. Like it's you need to, to have good ideas and like try different things. You need, like pe people don't like that. Um, if you're trying to do, if you find, because you find a different, better way of doing something. Um, so if you want to be more innovative, um, you have to be, you have to allow people freedom. So like the, I think it's no mistake that the, um, you know, Silicon Valley grew out of um, San Francisco, which was also the like center of the like, um, like hippie movement. And that you can read a book about like the sort of, 70s and 80s even like um like government funded research from um stanford uh, ai laboratory and um the nls um online uh the but doug and Bart and stuff like this but those people were all totally taking lsd with the hippies and that was like where a lot of their stuff um came from and i think you know we talk about like china um being authoritarian but I think that if China is going to grow, um, grow in power and if people, if, if China is going to start designing new stuff rather than just then, then having the like design in California built in China, um, China is actually going to have to become, it will become more relaxed. And they have already, they've got like, um, like Hong Kong, which is like a special area, um, which has different roles, um, where the like finance happens and, you know, there isn't the same sort of stuff. So. I think basically that freedom is essential to innovation, but you need to, like, that's why, um, you know, you get your best work done when the boss is on holiday um, and to build things, you know, like uh, the skunk works, like that um, a spy plane, right? The, the, the block, that big, you know, Batman spy plane thing. Like that was built, to build that, they had to get all the engineers and put them in a, in a skunk works, which is like a secret unit that is free from managerial interference. So 
working on new ideas in secret where people can't interfere can actually be um, like essential to like having good ideas. I see. So freedom is essential for innovation. Um, that kind of leads me to my almost last question. Um, how are you guys funded? Because basically you need you you need to have some sort of funding in order to have the freedom to 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 innovate, right? Yeah. So there's like a bunch of um, things. Um, so the the it started out with just um, I was just like working on it in my own time. Um, I had. By living on a boat, I mean, I didn't have to pay rent, so my living costs were um, greatly reduced. Um, right now, I have uh, a, a, a side job where I do security audits through least authority. Um, this is like a really good, um, this is like the perfect um, side job because I also keep current in how everything else works. So we're auditing lots of blockchain things and stuff like that. So um, I get to see what everyone else is doing. Um, there's companies that are emerging and building things on Scuttlebutt um, with this verse um, thing. They actually um, raised um, venture capital and are building an iOS app. They are funding some developers. Um, we had we received a, a grant from um, and from Definity, who are another interesting blockchain um, thing that I'm sure you've done a podcast about. Um, they just gave us 200 grand. Um, for no for no reason, basically, oh, because they wanted to support us, but they didn't ask for anything, and we just um, you know we just broke this up into little um, grants and shared it with the community. Um, I trust generally try to encourage anyone who wants to build something on Scuttlebutt, and you know this is sort of the sort of more of an uh, ecosystem approach. I think is more interesting because um, I don't want there to be like a single company that owns. Um, scuttlebutt i would much rather a network of companies that because i don't really trust any one company um even if they say they have good intentions then you know people change especially when money is involved and then um but if there's a whole bunch of companies they'll keep each other honest um like for example the web um itself like the web as a protocol and web browsers um, if you want to change the web browser you have to get uh, microsoft google Firefox, uh, Mozilla, and Apple on board, and because they are mutually suspicious of each other, um, have competing um, competing agendas, then one of them doesn't have the power to mess it mess it up and take over the whole thing. Um, even if they have a larger, a significant share like Google or something like this, they can't really control um, what happens. And the web doesn't mean that the web is the savior of everything, but I think that's basically it gives us a model. For how um, things can work. So um, I think a couple more. So at the moment, it's kind of a problem that we, there's just one company with a lot of money, but I think there's, there's um, but they, they haven't really missed it. They haven't, um, they're still just getting started. So there's totally room for like more things like that to appear. And I think the most um, interesting thing we're doing though is, you know, open source doesn't really doesn't really work that well um, with money. Like it's just open source is such a different thing. Like money doesn't really, for example, we've received like some money from just like small, uh, like regular people's donations and quite a, quite a lot compared to, you know, and we've, we've raised uh, like a few thousand dollars from just people donating like $5 a month. And that's actually pretty, that's actually pretty good as things go. But those same people who are donating a small amount of money are actually donating multiple hours of their time to like answering people's questions and things like that. And that time and that time is worth way more, I think, than the money they've been donating. So I'm interested in a thing where we basically have some kind of system, like a little bit of a system to coordinate um, just people's um, volunteer labor. So imagine something like um, like Kickstarter. Or um, Open Collective, which does um, recurring donations, but instead of donating um, money, you're donating time. The thing that I really like about the internet is how everything's free, um, and so much sort of like so Wikipedia was all entirely created by um, just like volunteers. And if we can build a thing where you don't even need the infrastructure, then I think you could build a thing, even big, impressive things, without actually using money. Um, at all so 
you know, to write software, all I need, I really have a laptop um, and it only costs a few hundred dollars. Um, then I just need um, coffee and somewhere to sleep, like the the actual, like, um, you know, the means of production, I really control it. So it's just about organizing. Um, it's just about organizing the labor. So where can people learn more about Secure Scuttlebutt and start using it? And uh, where would you recommend people go to? The best place to learn about Scuttlebutt is the is on Scuttlebutt. Um, the, we also have a website, which might be a good, uh, more accessible place. So scuttlebutt.nz. Um, there's also a bunch of the, the, all the repos are on GitHub under the uh, SSBC. That stands for Secure Scuttlebutt Consortium. Um, the consortium part is a joke. And and so from there, then they can download Patchwork or uh, this um, this uh, Android client that we mentioned uh, a bit earlier. Yep. The Android client you can install from the App Store. Um, I, I don't actually personally maintain either of these. So there's also another uh, client worth checking out called Patch Bay. Um, that's currently the most actively maintained um, and has interesting features such as that has chess. You can play decentralized chess. It's actually, actually very popular. Cool. That sounds wonderful. Dominic, thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, it was fascinating to learn about, about uh, Scuttlebutt and uh, I'll definitely keep using it. In fact, uh, there's one friend of mine who refuses to use any social media or even uh, you know, secure messaging. And I think the only way to reach him is probably through Scuttlebutt. So that's great. Yeah. All right. Thanks again for coming on and uh, have a good time in Berlin. Cool. Thanks very much. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.